Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our worship today. Let's begin by reading this together, Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Father God, we're here to sing your praises because you have dealt bountifully with us today. I promise in your name. Amen. worship our King, come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great promises, yes and amen, you will do great things, God, you will do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. So hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things.
stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. That was a, a blessed time of worship. I trust that you folks at home are, are singing along. The, the folks that are here in the room, they can't sing because we're supposed to keep our mask on and not sing. But I just really trust that you're participating in the worship by singing at home. Let's pray together. Father God, I, I thank you so much. I thank you so much. As we are re reminded by this song, you're the one that clears the way. We trust you. You never stop working. You're constantly at work in our lives and in the world around us. And we have that confidence to come to you in prayer because you are the way maker. Now, it's difficult, Lord, for us to see that sometimes. And I pray, God, that as we look at your word, that it will become more clear to us that you are the way maker. Father God, I want to pray for two things today. First, Lord, I want to pray for those who are suffering in this pandemic, Lord. It is not over. Here in New York, we're better off right now, but it's not over. Father, there are 238,000 people that have left this world because of this illness. We pray, God, for your relief. We pray, God, for your comfort. We pray, God, that you would work in the hearts and the minds of those in leadership to make wise decisions. We pray, God, that you work in the hearts and the minds of those scientists as they discover your knowledge. We trust you, our way maker. Father God, I want to pray today for our nation as we've just come off this rather tumultuous election. Lord God, as now as we now look to the future, Lord, I pray, God, that we in the church today we would not be red. We would not be blue. We would be followers of you. And Lord God, that we would bring peace, that we would bring hope, that we would share the hope of Christ, that we would speak truth to both sides of the discussion, that we would not be part of the problem, we'd be part of the solution. And I pray, God, for our leaders today. I pray, God, for the, the president who is in power right now. I pray, God, you'll give him wisdom these next two months. I pray, God, for the president-elect and the vice president-elect that you'll give them wisdom as they prepare. We put this in your hands because you are the way maker. I pray this believing in your name. Amen. Good morning, OCM. Today's scripture readings from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat 
or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing the scripture with us this morning and, and being here and being a part of the, of the worship service as we are gathered together. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll show all you folks at home, everyone who's here as we are worshiping live together. So, you know, I, I want, I'm in a few moments, I'm going to ask you all to begin to pray with me for my friends in Guatemala. Uh, this past week, there was a hurricane that passed through Central America. I believe it was Hurricane Eta. And it's something that's very, very serious right now in the terms of the, of the, of the flooding. You see, the real challenge of these hurricanes uh, for the rural areas of Guatemala is not the wind. And we're gonna, we have some video here we're going to show you. It is the flooding. There is so much rain dumped on the land that it just cannot handle it in the mountains. And the small streams become raging rivers. You know, a number of years ago, OCM had a, a short-term missions team in a place called San Lucas de Oliman. And it was after a hurricane. It was after people lost their homes. Terrible things had happened. And at that time, we, as we were uh, down there serving, and we were, built, were building houses, and we had a medical team in order to help them during this very difficult time. Uh, we're praying now. Well, what it is that God would have us to do as a church to support the folks there during this time. So what I want to do right now is just ask everybody here and at home, just take a few moments of quiet and let's pray together for the people in Guatemala. Father, we pray for our friends in Guatemala. We place them in your hands today. Amen. Now, as we are thinking about this idea of praying, you know, I just asked you to pray. D did you know what to pray for? Did you know what to pray for? Did you have any challenge finding the right words? Did you sense your purpose in part in what is happening in the rural areas of Guatemala? So often we are asked to pray for things that are so far away from us. But, yeah, but the other side of that discussion is, when do we ask for prayer? Why do we ask for prayer? Do we feel the need to ask for prayer? How do we know if people are even praying for what we ask people to pray for? How does prayer help us to fulfill our purpose in this world? You know, our text today was read by Aaron just a few moments ago. It's about the story of Esther. Now, you may or may not be familiar with that story. I suggested a few days ago to everyone, I can check with the people here, I can't check with you folks at home, uh, I suggest that you read it in advance. Now, I could ask you to raise your hand out there, um, but if you do, I, did anybody here may read Esther ahead of time? You did. Okay, we have one person there that did. Thank you very much. And that's a great thing. And then if you're at home, if you read Esther, why don't you put in the text there that you read Esther ahead of all these parts of it. You know, it's, it's something that is so, so important for us to, to be prepared for service. Now, if you have a Bible there in front of you, follow along, you know, while I share with you a short summary. Just get it out there so you can watch it. You know, the short version of the story is that Esther became the queen of Persia. Now, how she became queen is fascinating because she was not part of the ruling class. Basically, the, the king, who many scholars believe was Xerxes, uh, was having marital problems. And the king was having a major celebration. In the midst of it, he decided that he wanted his queen to come to court. The queen, whose name was Vashti, refused to obey his command and to come to court. She wouldn't come. Now, we are not sure why he called her to court. Since he had been drinking, and you know, there are many things that could have potentially occurred, and we don't even know why she refused. But we do know is that the king was furious. He, was, he felt disrespected, and, and the concern was that if she could get away with it, 
then all the women could do the same. So at the end of the chapter, we have Vashti losing her place as the queen of Persia. Now, there are many lessons that I could draw from this chapter, many of which have to do with what not to do in a marital relationship. I can tell you that I have never summoned Deb into my presence. When you read this book, look for some of those lessons. But this is just the beginning of the story that sets the stage for Esther, Mordecai, and Haman. In chapter 2, we have introduced Mordecai and, and, and Esther. They are both a part of the Jewish people who had been brought out of the country forcibly, and they were now part of Persian society. Mordecai was Esther's uncle, and he was raised uh, by him because she was an orphan. Now, the king it needed a new queen. So he sent his servants around the kingdom to bring in the most beautiful virgins to the palace with the potential of being the new queen. This is not the best model for finding a spouse for most of us. But he was a king. Of course, the method did not work out really too well for him the first time. Somehow, Esther was one of the young ladies chosen to go to court. We don't know the exact process, but we do know that Mordecai told her not to discuss her nationality. This leads us to believe that there were bad feelings towards the Jewish people at that time. Ultimately, Esther was chosen as queen, and chapter 2 ends with Mordecai discovering a plot to kill the king and, all, and, and alerting the king through Esther, who was in court at that time. Now, chapter 3 brings in Haman, who had become the chief advisor to the king. Because of his position, all the people were to bow down to him. And everyone did, well, everyone did except Mordecai. Now, the obvious question is, why didn't he just bow? Many writers say that it's because he would not bow to a man because he was, Mordecai was a follower of God. But, you know, that could be the case. But then what would happen if he was in the presence of the king? Would he still not bow? What is also interesting about this book is that it never mentions God. It never mentions God. That does not mean that Mordecai did not believe in God. But you wonder if this was just an issue with bowing. There could have been other issues between Haman and the Jews. It is clear in this chapter that Haman hated Jewish people and not just because of Mordecai. Maybe there was also tension. You know, what was the cause of this tension? It could have been because the Jewish people were financially successful. Maybe it was jealousy. It could have been because of a feud that existed between Haman's ancestors and the Jewish nation that went all the way back to the time of Moses, we can see in Exodus chapter 17. It could have been that they were not allowed to follow the king's laws and follow the laws of Moses. We don't know. Haman hated the Jews. It is not clear why Haman decided that all Jewish people must die. It clearly was connected with his jealousy, power, and finances. Whatever the reason, the result is that he manipulated the truth to achieve his own objectives. So he goes to the king and manipulates the facts. He convinces the king that these people who did not follow all the laws, which is technically true, were subversive to the kingdom, which was not true. He convinces the king to have all Jewish people killed. The king accepted what his trusted advisor said. This is hard for us to comprehend, but we have seen historically, even in our present world, how hatred by one group will seek the annihilation or the destruction of another group. In our country today, we need to be much more careful about truth. You know, the king allows Haman to prepare a decree which is sent throughout the kingdom that all Jewish people should be killed and their property confiscated. What is interesting is that at the end of chapter 3, it says that all people in the capital city were thrown into confusion. The people could not understand what their leaders were doing because it did not connect with their daily realities. Some were saying, why kill the Jews? Others were making preparation to loot and destroy. There was confusion. 
the Jewish people had to decide how to survive. When leaders lose their moral compass and do not present a clear moral direction, it creates a society of disorder and confusion. Again, there are many lessons from chapter 3 that are applicable to our world today. But I'll let you talk about those lessons with each other. We begin chapter 4 with Mordecai getting the attention of Esther. Mordecai goes to the gate and sits in mourning in sackcloth and ashes. Now, before we get into chapter 4, I'm going to ruin the rest of the story for you by telling you the ending because we are going to stop our discussion in the first part of chapter 5. Basically, Ruth steps in, Haman is killed, Mordecai becomes important. Am I not the best storyteller that you've ever heard? If you did not read the whole story, read it after service. It is fascinating. Now, back to the sackcloth and ashes. It is not clear. Uh, it, it is not clear if Mordecai felt partially responsible. It, it could very well have been that Haman was just looking for an excuse. But what Mordecai did know was that he had a connection in the palace. Now, I want to focus today on three phrases, one from each of our key characters, Mordecai, Esther, and Haman. Now, remember, I told you that God is not mentioned in this book, but you can see so clearly the truth that is emphasized in Scripture, that God's hand is clear everywhere we look. Esther lost her parents, which was a tragedy. That, was, that tragedy led to a special relationship between her and Mordecai. Vashti refused the king, which seems kind of crazy. But that action led to the need for a new queen. The king sent his advisors throughout the country, and they did not even ask the background of Esther. Seems like poor vetting. Uh, Esther physically appeals to the king more than the other women and is made queen. For some reason, Mordecai wants to prove a point with the second most powerful man in the kingdom by not bowing. I don't believe in co coincidence. I don't believe in random. I believe in purpose, even in the darkest moments of our lives. God is not mentioned, but God is everywhere. Just because people today do not acknowledge God does not mean that he is not active. Now, I am suggesting that we look at the apparent chaos of today as a precursor to the perfect plan of God. Now, at this point, Mordecai is not too happy. And he knows that if he gives a public display that Esther will hear about it. And she does hear. She does what any good caring relative would do. She sent him clothes. Now, in a Chinese family, she would have sent him food. Uh, but that is not what he wants. And he sends back to her the whole story with all the details. He tells her about the edict, the money paid, the, the bowing thing, everything. Then it says in Esther chapter 4, verse 8, he also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Now, this is a powerful verse. I sense that he is not remembering that Esther is not that little girl anymore. The NIV translates that Mordecai gave to the servant the information and to explain it to her. The word also can mean inform. We do have a sense that Mordecai did not seem, to, seem content to just send the information. He felt that he needed to explain it to her, uh, you know, and, and, you know, because he had not seen her doing something to that, that point. In her place, in the palace, she may not have heard about what was happening, or she may have felt that it was all outside of her control. When tragedy is occurring far away from us, the reality of it often does not sink into our perception. Then he goes a step further. He, it says in the NIV that he was to instruct her to go and do something, but the word is much more powerful, and it means that he ordered her to go. I think that Mordecai is making the same mistake that so many of us make. We want to force people to follow the truth. And we want to force them to believe the truth. You know, it's interesting in the contrast in the story because once again we have a woman here saying no. 
She told him basically that this was a suicide mission. Esther 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 says, All the king's officials and, and the people of the royal provinces know that for that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they may be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. And, for, un, and fortunately, Mordecai realized at this point that he needed to trust Esther, Esther to make a moral decision based on her own understanding of the situation. He had raised Esther. He knew her. He had instilled in her the moral framework and how to live her life. He realized that he should not be directing her decision, but guiding her decision by sharing with her the truth of God's wisdom. And here we have the phrase of a person who realized that the discussion was not just about the facts of what was happening. The discussion was about how should a follower of God respond. Mordecai said, said to her in verse 13, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? Who knows? But that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. We see in this simple phrase a vital principle for when we are facing rejection, persecution, disappointment, and failures, when we are facing the challenges of life, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I see in here the principle of connection. The principle of connection. God created man to have fellowship with him. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. The punishment of Cain was to wander alone. The punishment uh, of the psalmist wrote about the beauty of the spiritual community dwelling together in unity. The, the New Testament teaches about the body of Christ. The Old Testament law teaches us to love and care for others. The Bible is overflowing with this principle that is part of the creation of God. Sin separates man from God and man from man. Sin creates a world where my personal well-being is more important to me than your well-being. Mordecai reminded, reminded her. He didn't command at this time. He reminded Esther that her position in the court had a purpose greater than herself. And that, and that ultimately she might escape the problems of today, but in the end, when one group suffers, we all pay the price. The principle of connection tells us that our individual experiences of life are deeply entwined with the world around us. We do not know how our lives will impact others, but our lives will make a difference. And we do not know how the suffering of others impacts our lives. But in God's world, every single person is important. If the child in a third world country dies of starvation, it impacts all of us. If there is racial inequity in our community, it impacts all of us, whether or not we are personally the recipients. We are collectively, there is no one who is collectively more important. We are all collectively important. In this situation, Esther could not hide in the palace. Esther was the person prepared by God for just this moment. She could have hesitated. She could have given up. But Esther understood the principle of connection. She understood that. Her life was connected with the lives of others. Esther was a very intelligent woman. She did not need to be instructed. She knew what she had to do. And in keeping with the principle of connection, she asked for participation. It says in verse 16a, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. Esther realized the principle of connection. She knew that what she needed to do, but she would not do it alone. She told Mordecai to surround her uh, with fasting. It does not use the word prayer here, but in the, in the Jewish writers understood that there was, these were God's people and they were fasting and, they were, and praying and they were focused on God. This involved all of the Jewish people in the capital of Susa. 
Many of them may not have been entirely clear on what was happening. It does not tell us that they knew the whole story, but they had been called to fast and they came. And even though Esther was far away in the palace, her, she and her attendants did the same because distance does not minimize the power of the Spirit. Fasting and prayer is not for, for the intention of forcing God to bend to our will. It brings us together with a unified focus of following God's will and trusting His plan. It builds community and a common faith. If Christians are praying together, then they will serve together. If Christians are praying together, then they will serve together. I really like the contrast of Mordecai's response in verse 17 to how he, he had commanded Esther earlier. It says in verse 17, so Mordecai went away and carried out all Esther's instructions. The word instructions could be more clearly translated orders. He carried out all of her orders. Mordecai had to realize that Esther was no longer that young girl growing up in his home. He had to realize that she had depth and wisdom to the extent that she was the one that called for fasting. He had to realize that he had, he had fulfilled his role as her adopted father, and now she was to be followed. He carried out her orders, and he fasted for his niece. I believe that there comes a time when we need to realize that we have to let others lead. Let others have authority. I feel that the, the white male leadership of this country has pretty much made a mess of things. And I am ready for leadership to be passed on to all ethnicities and genders. We finally have a woman in the second highest office. We have to begin to listen for morality and wisdom from those speaking and not be swayed by the appearance or tradition. Esther spoke morality and wisdom. Listen to what she said in the second half of verse 16. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. For me, this is the most powerful phrase in the book of Esther. Esther as a person did not need to be ordered. As a person who provided mature leadership, as a person that was ready to sacrifice herself for others, she said, and if I perish, I perish. This was a principle of character. A principle of character. We can face the challenges of our life if we understand the principle of character. It is not about what we say, but it is about who we are that results in what we will do. If Esther had been simply a queen like Vashti, raised in the luxury of the court, spoiled by her parents and others, and never being expected to sacrifice for others, then her response would have been very, very, very different. Our society today is consumed with the pronoun me, and we have forgotten the pronoun we. How do I judge the character of leaders today? I try to envision them saying, and if I perish, I perish. This is not simply carrying a sign and raising your voice. This is, this is saying, I am going to put the well-being of others before myself. Is this what we see in our political leaders? Is this what we see in our church leaders? Is this what people see in me? And if I perish, I perish. This did not happen because Esther was totally different than anyone else. This was because Esther displayed the character that God had created in us to display that was exemplified in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and went to see the king. She did not hesitate and she did not delay. It says in, in chapter 5, verse 2, when, when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held, held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Many writers have really, I think, really silly commentary about this situation. They have trivialized the strength of this woman. They try to say that Esther manipulated him with her beauty. My friends, look at the text and forget about ridiculous cultural bias. It says that the king favored her. This is not a sexual term. Esther was an intelligent, beautiful woman who, had, who the king deeply respected and admired. Esther was a leader. She ordered the people to fast. She fasted. She put on her royal robes, and then she left the rest up to God. The king was not offering her the half of his kingdom. He was not offering the half of his kingdom to a, a beautiful woman with no sense. In God's word, 
time and again, spiritual female leaders are used to change the course of history. So we know that she twice asked the king to come to dinner with Haman. Now at this point, as you're reading, you are sitting there just waiting for how she's going to tell the king that, uh, that the number two man in the kingdom is doing something that is impacting her life. But you will have to read the rest of the story yourself. Um, I, I want to, I'm going I'm to I'm let you look at the rest of the story yourself. I want to look at our third character first, Haman. Haman is ambitious. Haman only cares about himself. Even to his own wife and friends, he feels the need to tell how great he is. It says in verses 11 and 12, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the nobles and officials. And that's not all Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. This was a man who served the king and the people solely for his own benefit. He rose to power because of his skills, but in the end, he was only concerned about himself. Now, I am not, going, I am not, now I am not sharing uh, Haman with you today because I believe that we have a huge Haman problem in our church. But, I, but we do have a huge Haman problem in our world today. And it does affect us. It does affect God's creation. It does affect the future for our children. What do we do? Well, after we accept the principle of connection and take to heart the principle of character, we find the per third principle at play. Haman said in verse 13, but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. All that Haman did, all that Haman lived for, all that Haman fought for will never be enough for him. This is, that is the incredible power of sin. There will never be enough. There will never be satisfaction. There will always be consequences. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. This is the principle of consequence. Haman failed because of his own sinful self centered on hateful ambition. It consumed him. It made him incapable of seeing life in the way that God created us to see life. When we forget the principle of connection, that our lives are connected with others, when we forget the principle of character, and set aside being concerned about, about, um, about who we are morally, then we are impacted by the principle of consequence. We, we will be accountable for our lives and our selfishness. This is sin, rejection of God's character. Ultimately, Haman's ambition and hatred caused him and his family to lose everything. It may seem harsh, but there are consequences to our sinfulness. My friends, what is the value of studying a book like Esther? We don't see the law of God spelled out for us. We don't see the great theological discussion like we do in the letters of Paul. The book of Esther is about how, what God's law looks like in real life. The book of Esther shows us how when people do follow the law of God in their daily lives, how it affects their decisions every day. The books of Esther shows how when people deny God's law and live selfishly, what it looks like. The book of Esther shows us how the hand of God in the course of history takes the good and the bad for his ultimate purpose. My friends, get together today and read the book of Esther, looking for those principles as they look like in real life. And as you read it, think about the three principles that I have suggested today. And who knows, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. The principle of connection. We are not an island Every experience of our lives is being woven into the fabric of the tapestry of this world. As I make decisions, am I thinking in context of personal survival or am I looking for my part in the bigger picture of life? Am I passing to my children that this world is not just about them? 
Do I realize that praying together is vital to the spiritual community? Do I realize that praying together makes us one and enables us to serve together? Do I realize that when I pray for the people in the landslides of Guatemala, that it connects me to them? We need to pray together. And if I perish, I perish. The principle of character. Who we are morally, spiritually, ethically does matter. Who our who our lead who are, if our leaders are who they are morally, who our leaders are morally, including myself, morally, spiritually, and ethically, it does matter. We can never say, and if I we can never say, and if I perish, I perish, if the law of God is not planted into the gardens of our heart. Life changes does not begin with having the list to follow. It begins with reading a book like Esther and saying, what is it that I need to be? How can I change? What thinking is keeping me from living that life? Life changes begins with reading about the life of Christ and saying that that, that is what I want to be. How can I change? What thinking is keeping me from having that in my life? But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. The principle of consequence. We will be faced with those who reject God. They appear to be successful as they flout the law of God, as they oppose the law of God, as they live a life that ignores the, the, the needs of humanity. But there are consequences. There are consequences to their immediate satisfaction with what God has given us to, in our lives. They will always find ways to try to get more, even if it means destroying others. And many times we will see the consequences in their destruction. There will be times when we will not personally see the consequences. But Scripture clearly says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So, you know, my friends, let's get together. Have some fun with the book of Esther. You know, make a, a list of the principles of God that you see in this book. Compare how those principles have played out in your lives. Esther was a part of achieving the greater good for her people. How, how can you and I be a part of achieving the greater good in the midst of a world that with so many who have the mentality of Haman? Now, I am sure that many of you are wondering if this passage was chosen because of, this, of the election that just passed. The honest truth is that we chose this passage months ago as part of our series. And no... My choice of a blue shirt is not a statement of my political leanings. Uh, I just happened to have a rotation of shirts, and today was my blue one, even though Barnabas told me all my shirts look blue on camera. So I guess it's, I'm always blue. But no, that's not the case. And so, you know, what often happens is that we realize God's hands moving over the small plans we make, and he gave us this passage today. I shared with you last week that we have to have a role to carefully and conscientiously vote. Then we have the role of accepting God's decision and then speaking truth. That's what I said last week. No matter what side of this discussion you find yourselves on, we now have a president and vice president-elect. Now, what is our part in achieving the greater good? Remember, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. You and I are here today for a purpose. We cannot just stay in our palace hoping that someone else will fix the problems. We will have a, we will have a new president and a new vice president, and they cannot fix all the problems. I ask myself, why am I here today? Why am I speaking to the English congregation of OCM? Esther told Mordecai and all the Jewish people in Susa to fast together. As, and are we as a church as we as a church praying together. We are separate, but we can only be together spiritually, folks, if we are praying together. My friends, find a way to consistently pray with your brothers and sisters. Don't just talk about the problems, 
pray about the problems. Our country, our world needs us to pray. Are you praying with your spiritual community? Esther had to speak. For too long, too many in the church have remained silent in the face of injustice and immorality for the sake of freedom and economic comfort. With Esther, we must show our true biblical character and say, and if I perish, I perish. We need to ask ourselves, what has kept us from speaking the truth? You may say we are just a few people here. They, they will not hear us. But folks, my, but, but folks, our role is not to be heard. It is to speak. Our role is not to be heard. It is to speak. I ask myself, what has kept me from speaking? Today at our after-service coffee time, well, I'll, I want to be there with you to discuss something. And this will be our discussion focus today, is what will we do as a spiritual community of believers in a Beyond Walls church to support the needs of our world today? What can we do today? I invite you to join me in that discussion. And remember that God is in control of the Hamans and this world. Haman was never satisfied until it finally destroyed him. He said, but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. We do not need to fight the Hamans, my friends. We need to speak the truth. We need to live righteously. We need to spend less time attacking people and more time attacking problems. My friend, the election is over and God is in charge. Please do not forget that 238,000 people have died from a deadly virus and it is getting worse. Have you prayed about that today? God will take care of the Hamans. I would like to close this service once again, realizing that I have been placed here today for this moment to pray well, for my friends in Guatemala and the pandemic. Father God, I come to you humbly today, realizing this incredible God that we serve, who knows the beginning and the end. I pray for my brothers and sisters and our friends in Guatemala. Keep them safe. Help them to recover in the tragedies that they're facing. And I pray, God, for this pandemic today. We place those people in your hands. Give them comfort. Give them hope. Show us how we can pray. I promise believing in your name. Amen. If the earth is free, Take me there, take me there If you're looking for an offering It's right here, my life is here I'll be a living sacrifice for you The refine, the refiner I'll be consumed
Morning, OCM. Please join your heart with mine as we receive God's blessing together. Let's pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and give you peace. Help us, Lord God, to trust in you, to know that you are in control of everything. Help us to have connection, to have character, to know that there are consequences if we don't follow you. Lord, we pray that you would grant us integrity and morality. To stand up against injustice, to know that you are the one who is in control, and that we follow you and not the things of this world. Lord, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Got my mic. It was wonderful to worship with you today. I uh, want to remind you of a few announcements today. We had our live service uh, registration. We have a full house here today. So if you want to come, you'll have to register in advance because we, we definitely have a lot of our full house today. Uh, so just that'll be on the website. You can register in advance on the website. 
Uh, after service talk sheets are going to be available a little later today. I need to make some changes to them uh, in light of some of the recent events. So a little bit later today, uh, I'll have the after service talk sheets on the website. The gospel project today, the CA class, is today at 12 o'clock p.m. And it's the call to courage of Joshua chapter, chapters 1 through 4. The call to courage. Our Discovering Christ in the Old Testament class is this Tuesday, 8 o'clock, and I did not write down the topic. So I know it's going to be good, so I encourage you to join the, uh, the class this Tuesday. Now, every year, for many years, we've had our Thanksgiving gathering. It's been one of the highlights of the year for a lot of people, especially Peter Wong. He loves the Thanksgiving dinner. This year, we're not going to be able to gather together as a, as a community uh, for dinner, but we're going to do something on Wednesday evening. It's our normal prayer meeting time. And I'll give you more details, but just plan ahead. We want to pray together as a spiritual community. So just want to alert you that's going to be coming up as we have our Thanksgiving prayer time together the, the day before Thanksgiving. I mentioned the co-workers meeting coming up. Uh, don't forget about the co-workers meeting at the, the last Sunday of this month. Uh, you can get the details of that from the website. You have to register for that ahead of time. And I just put my friends, I just want to just challenge you together as a Beyond Walls Church, to come together, pray together. Let's look together for what God has called. We've been placed here for a reason and purpose. Let's see what it is that God has for us to do today. So as we close the service, I'm going to ask Cheryl to go to the other camera real quick and see if, just to kind of pan around so you can see there. And brothers and sisters, we're looking forward to worshiping with you again next week.